Okay. Um, so being the policy breakout group, um, is that better? Okay. Being the policy breakout group, I'm a little bit hesitant to get up here because, of course, we don't have a lot of concrete things, whereas some of the things that have come out of the, the discussions are um, very concrete, and I'm always jealous of that um, when we talk about policy because there's a lot of really important discussions, um, but how we get at them sometimes can be a bit um, challenging. So um, like Howard, I'd like to thank the group. We had <coughs> actually nine different countries represented, and um, so we had a lot of, of experience, both in terms of, of what the individuals had done, but also the cultures within which they are working, um, which is, of course, also very important um, to the policy discussions. Um, and also, we had about a third, pardon? Um, not yet. <laughs> um, we had about a third of our members um, that were responsible for healthcare delivery systems and for thinking about how to integrate research into health. And they weren't all from the genomics field. And so I think that also gave us um, a broad perspective. And I wanted to be able to say that before I put up the first slide, which we can now show. Because um, one of our early um, discussions was to come out and, and make a clear statement with very broad agreement that genomics was not unique in some of the questions that we were thinking about in, in terms of the policy solutions that we would need um, and that it would be very helpful if we were to think about it and think about um, the kinds of solutions or pathways to solutions that we need to get to um, by thinking about genomics as another tool um, for health and that it's one element that needs to be considered in moving towards personalized medicine. Um, that we can look to past examples of how other new technologies have moved into healthcare um, and learn from them. <laughs> And, and think about them as we're trying to put together um, our own next steps. Um, also, I think one of the strong recommendations from the group is that we needed to think about um, what genomic medicine has to offer with regard to um, the comparator of what our current care pathways are and where do we see the differences to make, um, to enhance the current care and move from that standpoint um, in what we're doing. So um, in terms of the priorities that we did talk about, um, we were um, talked about in the beginning all of the various issues that the many speakers raised um, through their talks and the challenges. But I think this list, while it might be a bit simplified and certainly doesn't cover everything that came up or that everything that we discussed, I think these were the key things that, that we acknowledged as being um, major issues. Several of them are addressed or have components that are addressed from other working groups, and so we didn't spend time on them. Um, but of course, engaging the stakeholders, the issues around funding, who's going to support the work, um, the research that needed, that's needed, as well as the technology assessments, et cetera, um, to move the work forward. Um, who are the right decision makers for the um, healthcare in, in different countries? It varies. It's, it's different in every case. That, of course, complicates trying to think about um, moving things forward in one nation, let alone as we're trying to look internationally. Um, and then, of course, also the patients are the stakeholders and that um, as we can engage patients, and this has already come up in the breakout reports, um, then they will also push for um, this, the benefits from genomic medicine as part of personalized care, um, personalized medicine to come forward. Data sharing, obviously, um, it never fails to come up as a key issue. Privacy, informed consent, um, the morass of legal issues, again, within one country, and particularly then when we start talking internationally um, about how to um, <coughs> harmonize or find common principles around privacy and informed consent so that we can promote better data aggregation um, to enable the research and the science um, and to promote sharing um, as well from, from the ethics standpoint. Um, the regulatory oversight that came up this morning, um, in particular around FDA and the situation that we're facing, but also in others, and then um, the cost benefits, the costs and the benefits of adding genomics to the care systems. Again, thinking about it from a systematic or a systems perspective. I think among these, um, the engaging the stakeholders issue we didn't really talk about in terms of opportunities and next steps. I think some of that has been addressed um, by Bruce's group um, and others. It just didn't really make it to our, our strongest priority. 
where we actually spent most of the time and pretty quickly got to a focus on was this issue of um, how do we determine the costs and the benefits of adding genomics to our care systems. And so that's where um, most of, of our um, recommendations or, or um, it, detail of, of the opportunities will focus. So first with the data sharing and the regulatory issues, um, the primary point that our group really wanted to, to bring forward in terms of what, are our, what are, should our next steps be is that there are many different groups and different alliances that are out there working on this in an international perspective. Um, we've heard a lot about IRDIC um, in rare diseases. There is the Global Alliance. There's the Genomic um, Medicine Alliance um, that was talked about this morning. There are just a lot of people out there already working on these. And also some of the issues around um, privacy and informed consent that enable data sharing for the research to go forward are also focused on the research end of the spectrum and not the implementation end in terms of integrating genomics into care. And so that, that this might not be the best place for our group to form, to do a lot of additional work. But where it could be very useful in the future for, for um, people from this group to think about is trying to, to map what the different activities are from all of these different groups and alliances and what are the issues that they're working on so that we can um, both know who is working on what and how they're approaching it so that we can all learn from it, um, but also to do the gap analysis of and see is there a unique place that we can get to where we can make a contribution um, that is not already being addressed by some other group um, with perhaps better expertise than we might be able to bring to it. And and so um, there were also talked about whether or not we might encourage um, a network of networks to form, again, around those, you know, all of the different groups working on informed consent or all of the different um, groups looking at, at particularly engaging different sets of stakeholders. And we put this up here, but acknowledging that network of networks is a great policy phrase that sounds good but is really questionable as to what it might actually mean. Um, so, but we did think that it, it could be a way um, to share information and to try and articulate a more, more clearly what the responsibilities are and who has um, ownership of trying to push different issues forward because we thought that would be helpful. Again, just so that we don't all try to duplicate um, in the same, the same problem area. So moving back over then to the costs and the benefits um, and trying to think about that in terms of what will genomics add um, to care in a delivery system. And um, we talked a lot about trying to define what is it that we would need to have in order to go forward. Um, and so there is, of course, the technology assessment, the evidence, but there was a working group that that's, we've already heard from talking a lot about that. So we didn't dwell on how do you determine um, what the evidence <coughs> is. Um, but of course, in addition to the scientific evidence, we need to have demonstrated clinical utility. Um, and we need to be able to articulate what the costs are. They could be small costs or they could be large costs, um, but those costs need to be known so that they can be weighed in balance to the clinical advantages, um, et cetera. So again, this is a place where one thing that could be done would be to, to look at um, and do some analyses on different um, successes in the past, those that had a great deal of evidence to support them, such as PET scans was an example that we talked about, as well as those um, new techniques or methods that, that um, are, are put into care very rapidly sometimes without a lot of evidence. And what's, what is it about those that, that um, have them move in? And then, of course, the difficulties with getting them out of care um, when they are, when there is evidence to say that they're not helpful. Um, another potential opportunity um, where a group could come together to, to look at this, and this was something that we thought we needed to take a look at the literature and see what might already have been done in this area, what, but would be taking the perspective of the healthcare delivery system, trying to um, walk through that in a pipeline fashion and think about where would genomics make a difference, again, to help us get to the point of being able to define um, where the economic costs would be and where the clinical advantages would be. Um, we thought about this along the lines of, of different disease models that could be done. Um, there's also talk about really, if we wanted to make a difference for healthcare in a, in a large scale, we'd be looking at what is genomics going to do for chronic diseases. And there seemed that maybe um, because the science may not quite be there yet, um, there hasn't been as much work in looking at or having models or pilots to think about how genomics might be able to improve um, care for hypertension or diabetes or mental health, et cetera. 
Um, and But that what we really needed to get to was where is genomics going to make the biggest impact on care, and that's how we're going to engage the state, engage the decision makers, um, and provide them with information and evidence to um, get them to be willing to try and integrate this into care. Um, there we go. So um, I think this is about my last slide. So again, thinking about um, what will we need, the economic issues and the need for more um, economic analyses, better economic analyses, inputs to have into the system for helping us to determine um, evidence came up. Um, we talked a lot about who else is already doing this. Again, thinking about the fact that genomics is just one tool. This has been done in other places, and we should look to places like the health technology assessment agencies in, in various countries, um, pharmacoeconomic societies that do this all the time to see what we could learn about how would we structure um, some of these analyses for um, genomic methodologies in particular. Um, they talked about the fact that in Canada, as one example, um, they are requiring in some cases that health, health economists now be part of the research team so that those questions are being brought to the table um, at the time that the research is being designed um, and all along the way. Um, and then also needing to recognize that it's not just about technology assessment um, in terms of making the decision, but that, that the technology assessment then becomes an input um, to those who are making the payment decisions around um, care um, for insurance or other um, health systems. And of course, again, as we've heard over and over again throughout the meeting and in this, these breakout reports, needing to engage those who are making the payment decisions. Um, one um, recommendation for something that might be worth trying to pursue would be to work in a system other than the U.S. Um, we didn't come up with the ideal system, but where there is one or maybe just a few centralized payers so that, again, we could um, have conversations with them about what is it that they needed to see where we have hope of trying to get something that's definable. Um, again, unlike in the U.S., where we get lots of different answers, um, so that we could um, try and, and look at a particular case and carry that through um, for a pilot or demonstration and use that then to move on to other examples. So that, I think, was um, in this area was our top recommendation for, for what the opportunity would be in terms of what we might do as a next step. And then while this, um, the other issue about trying to integrate um, economics and economists into our research teams is something that um, I think there was also a lot of agreement with, and, and that, um, in terms of, of who can act on that, would be funders, but I think anyone really in how they're designing their research projects and putting together their research teams um, could look at it. And I'll stop and take any questions, and also invite the group, please. Um, I'm, the synthesis of this was all very different from the actual flow of our conversation, so if I misaligned anything, please, please stay up. This is terrific. I, um, I guess I would, just uh, following up on your last point um, and the discussion that we had earlier about evidence generation, it would seem that if there's already a project, pilot project going on in an environment that lends itself, like a single payer environment that might lend itself to economic analysis and it's not happening, um, that would be something to really try to embrace that um, a way to find the resources to make sure that that analysis is done, or secondly, to um, consider a, uh, an, a, an, a, an existing pilot project from any of our global communities uh, and making sure that it, or selecting an environment where that could be done with the appropriate economic analyses as a, as a demonstration project, as you say. And the other, uh, it seems that the, uh, this, this whole area um, it was, should be of significant interest to industry because it's uh, their, their ability to launch a product, get it on the market, get it reimbursed and adopted is going to be predicated on having the economics work in their favor. So it uh, would be an opportunity, I think, to partner not just with some of the agencies you mentioned, but with industry as well. That's a really astute approach, I think. Um, and this community is in a place, such a project or several projects would be easiest to do if there wasn't a lot of population variation um, in the disease, for want of a better word, forgive me, I'm not a geneticist, um, and also if there were a straightforward genetic test that could be applied to identify 
the target population because that makes the Markov model or whatever economic tool you're going to use to do the economic analysis more straightforward to use. So choosing the project wisely um, would be of high value and this group's probably an ideal group to make that decision um, from a research yeah, I, I would um, uh, agree that a focus on economics is important. The only uh point of contention that I might make is that um, there are actually different ways to look at this that can take into account variability, which is uh, to uh, model so that you look at a threshold of effectiveness model so that you can manage to say, you know, if the prevalence of this particular genomic variant is this level, if it's above this level in a population, it is cost effective to do this. If it's below this level, it is not cost effective. And so in terms of how you define the problem and also define the model, um, you can come up with very uh, useful th things that can be applied to an individual uh, country or group once they know what their uh, what the prevalence of that is in their particular population. Those things are also related to sensitivity and specificity right. and the cost that you would purchase the test on. Right. There are all sorts of thresholds yeah. that you so, can get an end threshold. Yeah, so the point that was being made is that there's lots of variables and the, the difference between an, an economist and a statistician is that statisticians require data. Um, okay. <laughs> Right. So, uh, uh, so all of these are assumption based, and so the, uh, the uh, doing sensitivity analysis on the models to, uh, and that allows identification of what are the most important pieces of data to really understand, because they most profoundly affect the performance of the model. That is also extremely important information because that can drive the research agenda to say, you know. We don't know the answer to this, but it doesn't matter because if you vary it between one and a hundred, the model performs exactly the same. But if this, if we're off by a factor of two in this one, the model completely uh, works differently. So. And that's why the question of what evidence you accumulate and evaluate right. the economist at the end of the R&D so Right. So just the point that she was making was that defines the prioritization of the evidence collection. Mm -hmm. 